Good morning and a happy new year to all. Well, we live in interesting times, don't we? I hadn't imagined that once more we wouldn't be able to worship together in person. And yet we can be thankful for, for many things, in particular that this Omicron variation does not seem to be resulting in as much serious illness as the earlier strains of the virus have. And the news from South Africa is good where this variation began as the wave of Omicron is subsiding. Life seems to be beginning to return to normal there. So hopefully that will be true for us as well before too long. Just a few announcements uh, before we begin. Uh, a first meeting of our visitation team. Uh, I was going to schedule this for next Saturday. Uh, but we'll go back to our earlier practice last year of meeting over Zoom, and I'll be sending a email out in due course um, for that. Uh, secondly, the congregational and official board meetings, I think we'll think about those a little bit closer to the time and determine at that stage whether to reschedule or to hold them on Zoom because of the, um, the, the uh, condition with the virus at the moment. Uh, thirdly, Margaret is putting in a fund script order on Monday, uh, and if you would like to order any cards, uh, let her know today. Her email is flatwoodin, F-L-A-T-W-O-D-I-N-N, at gmail.com. We'll see that these get delivered to you. Uh, lastly, the men's lunch, uh, which is to be held, uh, was to be held at the 11th of January, uh, I imagine we'll probably defer this unless there's a significant change for the better in terms of the COVID community spread. Uh, these are the announcements uh, for today. And for those who are celebrating a birthday or have just celebrated a birthday, I'm not going to attempt to sing happy birthday to you online. Um, I like to have Jordan accompany uh, me when I do that. But I do wish you well on this uh, special day. Amen. Well, Advent is over, and so now we continue our practice. We begin our practice of lighting the Christ candle, um, as we would have done at uh, Christmas. Come all people of God to a place where our hearts are open and ready to receive God's precious gift, to a time when sharing the news of birth and hope gives us a glimpse of a bright future. Come, let us worship and praise as we celebrate a new year, new beginnings, and new hope for the world. Come into the light of Christ. Amen. We join in our call to worship. However, we have wandered from God. God comes to find us and to gather us in generous love. However broken we have become, God comes to heal us and make us whole in hope. However empty our spirits may be, God comes to feed us until we are filled to the brim with grace. Amen. reading from John 1, 1 verses 1 to 18. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. From the very beginning, the word was with God. Through him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without him. The word was the source of life and this life brought light to humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. God sent his messenger, a man named John, who came to tell people about the light, so that all should hear the message and believe. He himself was not the light. He came to tell about the light. This was the real light, the light that comes into the world and shines on everyone. The word was, with, was in the world, 
and through God made the world through him. Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own country, but his own people did not receive him. Some, however, did receive him and believed in him. So he gave them the right to become God's children. They did not come, become God's children by natural means, that is, by being born as the children of a human father. God himself was their father. The word became a human being and, full of grace and truth, lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory which he received as the father's only son. John spoke about him. He cried out, this is the one I was talking about when I said, he comes after me, but he is greater than I am because he existed before I was born. Out of the fullness of his grace, he has blessed us all, giving us one blessing after another. God gave the law through Moses, but grace and th truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only son who is the same as God and is at the father's side, he has made him known. I always remember going with Margaret and the children to the John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This must have been around 1988 or 89, I can't remember exactly which one, but it was before they launched the Hubble telescope during one of the uh, space shuttle missions. And we were lucky enough to see the uh, NASA technicians actually working on the Hubble as they were preparing it for its launch date. And the Hubble has now been in orbit for over 30 years, uh, bringing a wealth of information about our universe to scientists and astronomers. Uh, for example, among many accomplishments, um, the Hubble helped to pin down the age of the universe, now known to be 13.8 billion years old. Well, on December the 25th of 2021, Christmas Day, uh, NASA launched the James Webb Telescope. And this telescope, though of similar size to the Hubble, has a telescopic mirror which is five times larger. It's deployed much further out into space, about a million miles away from the Earth, over twice the distance of the Moon from the Earth. But the most remarkable thing about the Webb Telescope is its ability to detect infrared light at great distances. It will be able to see the faintest light emissions coming from the remotest galaxies that were formed over 13 billion years ago. Amazing. In other words, it will be looking at what happened at the very beginning of creation. And it reminded me of what John is doing in the introduction or the prologue of his gospel. He is using a theological telescope to look back through time. His first verse echoes the words of Genesis in Hebrew, Bereshit Barab Elohim, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But he's actually looking back further than that, before time even existed, when there was only God and the Word, which was with God. And the Word is God's thought and mind. And God is proclaiming that Jesus is that word of God made flesh. And here is the irony for me. Jesus not only shares his divinity with God, but he shares with us his humanity. And this to me suggests that at the beginning, in the beginning and from the beginning, even before creation, God has always been with us. And we have always been with God. John is writing about the incarnation. And the word incarnation comes from the Latin incarnatio, which means to enter into the act of being made flesh. And this is the whole meaning of the Christmas story that we just celebrated, that God entered into our history in human form and that through Jesus, 
God met us face to face and in person. The one who created all things became part of his or her creation. The other week we were watching a film about the Christian writer C.S. Lewis called The Reluctant Convert. And he was describing the incarnation where creation is like a play. And the writer of the play wants to meet the characters in person. And C.S. Lewis said, for example, that the only way that Shakespeare could ever meet Hamlet would be if Shakespeare himself became one of the characters in his play. And that is essentially what John means by the incarnation. God enters this play that we are all a part of and meets us to be with us face to face in Jesus. And John, through the incarnation, is also correcting our misguided views about God. In a book called God Was in Christ, the author Donald Bailey writes, it is astonishing how lightly many people assume that they know what the word God means. But it is still more astonishing that even when we profess Christian belief and try to set out and understand the mystery of God becoming man, we're apt to start with some conception of God picked up we know not where, an idol of the cave or the marketplace, which is different from the Christian conception. And then we attempt the impossible task of understanding how such a God could be incarnate in Jesus. Well, in a book called America's Four Gods, the authors reveal from a 2008 survey conducted in the United States that 28% of those surveyed believed in an authoritative God who is engaged in the world but is also judgmental. 22% believe in a benevolent God who is involved in our lives and is loving and is not stern. Others believe in a critical God who is removed from daily events but will render judgment in the afterlife. And then the fourth category believe in a, a distant God who set the world in motion and then disengaged from it. Well, our failure to fit our misconceived understandings of God to the incarnate Christ has created much, if not most, of the darkness in our world. A darkness caused by those particularly who are religious, where their concept of God has resulted in bias, unfairness, and prejudice against others because of their gender or their sexual orientation or their nationality or their race. As preacher Jim Somerville says, instead of looking at God through the clear, unclouded lens of the person of Christ, we turn the telescope around and we try to look at Christ through our clouded and preconceived notions of God. But you see, John, in his gospel, is turning the telescope the right way around and giving us light and understanding of who God is through the person of Jesus. John, in the prologue of his gospel, talks about light and darkness. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Well, John wrote his gospel during a time of great darkness against a backdrop of the destroyed temple, a demolished city of Jerusalem, and the persecution of the early Christians. And the darkness has never gone away. It is still with us. Theologian Steve Bauman notes the darkness remains in wars, in human devastation, in greed and in torture, in oppressions of every variety, and in the darkness that may be in our own personal lives through depression, confusion, helplessness, and hopelessness. And the darkness to some extent is with us now as we continue to grapple with this pandemic. Many are in isolation. I believe we have about 5,000 in PEI at the moment, if I heard correctly. And many are unable to meet with their families over Christmas. There were people stranded in airports all around the world. There is the economic impact of uh, COVID-19 and people unable to work, businesses struggling through lack of staff, uh, not to mention the five million lives lost through COVID. The exhaustion of our health workers, which you could see reflected in the tired face of 
Dr. Heather Morrison during her last COVID-19 update. And as a church, once more, we're unable to safely worship together in person. And at this point, we have no idea how long this will last for. In the beginning, we are in the beginning of a new year. And you know, normally I feel I can look through the telescope into the future and imagine that with some idea what the coming year is going to look like. Well, I don't know about you, but this year, just not able to do that very well. Uh, what I see through the lens seems a bit cloudy and dim. But you know, even in these times, which are difficult and dark, in the beginning, in the beginning of an uncertain year, we can go forward holding on to the truth of the Incarnation. We may not be able to meet with each other in person, but God has always been with us and will continue to be with us and among us. The God who created this world understands the need for physical presence. When John says the word became flesh and lived among us, he uses a word which in Hebrew is shechen, which means that in Christ, God pitched his tabernacle or tent among us. It's a very physical, concrete image of a tent erected on top of our muddy red soil and the tent pegs hammered in. God is with us in Christ. In the middle of his prologue, John suddenly introduces John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light. Well, I believe that John the writer is suggesting that we, with the knowledge that God is with us in Christ, we, having seen the light in the midst of darkness, are like John the Baptist. We are called to be witnesses of that light to others. And like the incarnation, we are invited in Jesus to see that the words that we associate with our faith, particularly that word hope, become incarnate and take on flesh. Well, how do we put flesh on our hope? We can see the examples of Christians who have lived in darkness, people who were themselves able to rise above despair. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who passed away last week on the 26th of December, said that hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. And he knew what he was talking about because during a time of apartheid when so many governments seemed to be supporting the policies of the South African government by their refusal to divest of this regime, overturning apartheid seemed impossible. But Tudu said, remember, the sea is made up of drops of water. And what you do as one drop um, where you are is of significance. So we should never feel overwhelmed by the circumstances we live in. But by demonstrating our hope before us, we encourage others to hope. And Archbishop Tutu said that countless supporters of the fight against apartheid were, were students who tried and most often failed to persuade their institutions to divest or speak out against apartheid. But it was their hope that made the difference. So let us seek ways in which to make our faith incarnate and to put flesh on our words of faith, each of us, one drop of water in the body of Christ by helping and encouraging and reaching out to others, even in small ways, an email, a phone call, a card, by living our faith in the flesh, we can bring the hope that we have in the incarnate Christ to others. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us lift up our hearts and our minds in prayer. Lord of yesterday, today and tomorrow, we gather here this first Sunday of the new year in a mixture of hope, anticipation, fear, excitement and expectation. We do not know what the year holds for us. There are things we are afraid of, worries about health and family, job security and finances. There's much to look forward to, weddings, anniversaries or baptisms, holidays to enjoy, friends to laugh with. Lord God, the coming year is full of uncertainty and hope. Whatever the year holds for us, though we trust you and we place every day of this year into your care, knowing that as in the past, you are with us, caring for us with constant love. And so, Lord, we place ourselves into your keeping and dedicate our lives to your service, through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Saviour, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now we go out into the world. May the coming year be one of increased riches of grace, experiencing God's voice more clearly, knowing God's heart more deeply, resting in God's love more fully, trusting God's care more completely, following God's pathway more peacefully, and understanding God's presence more intimately. Thanks be to God. Amen. Have a great day and look forward to seeing you soon.